I'm going to set the team a challenge. Uh, I am, for better or worse, a fan of Sheffield United Football Club, the mighty blades in the championship. We are a very cohesive team, but we're also rubbish because we haven't got the capabilities, we haven't got the players. And I wonder, as we move into this next decade with the NATO 2030 agenda, that we are entering what is seriously an inflection point of power. And that NATO, if it's going to meet the challenge of that power, will have to be adapted uh, to meet the defense and deterrence challenge, as well as the stability challenge that's coming uh, our way. And much of that challenge will be European. Make no mistake, much of that challenge will be European. So I suppose my question that I'm posing implicitly is this. If defense and deterrence and NATO's commitment to the South are to be credible, what does the strategic concept have to do to ensure that NATO stays in the Premier League today, the coming decade, 2030 and beyond? Because decisions we make now will resonate into the 2030s. And as I said in a recent speech at NATO HQ, I think there's a good chance that the next 10 years could see 70 years of defense technological change crammed into it, the equivalent thereof. So this is going to be a very, very important strategic concept indeed. Now to address the question of what is the future of NATO under this strategic concept, I have three extremely distinguished guests who are here on the platform with me right now. And one, I hope, is a virtual presence. Uh, Baiba Braze is an old friend, Assistant Secretary General for Public Diplomacy uh, at NATO. You will all know here of this parish. Uh, Ambassador Tomasz uh, Szatkowski is the Permanent Rep Representative of Poland for the North Atlantic Council. And Eric's appeared. Eric Bradberg has appeared uh, with us. He is the Director of the Europe Programme for the Car Carnegie Endowment for Peace. The way I'm going to play this is five minutes each for our speakers in the order of the program, but then I'm going to reach out to you. I want more interaction from the floor. Uh, two things to say on that. There are two microphones you can see at either end of the stage. If you have a question, come up to the microphones, because we can't, for COVID reasons, hand around the microphone as in the past. And can I again draw your attention to the hashtag RigaConf2021 if you have a question you wish to pose uh, through social media. So without further ado, five minutes, Baiba, please. Thank you very much. And uh, Lavaka Riga, uh, good evening, everyone. First, my thank you to LATO, Latvian Transatlantic Organization, whom I helped to establish quite a long time ago and who was member number one, I still am, and I'm very proud of that. I also thank the Latvian government, not only for supporting this conference, but we being among the exclusive club of 2% of, the, of, of those spending 2% of defense and even more this year, uh, as is Poland and the other Baltic states. On the strategic concept and the very pointed questions that uh, you put to us, uh, Julian, uh, I think we all have to look really at the strategic level at that. This is not the annual communique or once in two years a communique which says a lot at you know, where allies politically uh, sort of decide that they are at that very moment. In the same time, when you look through the communiques of the year, you will see the accumulation of the change that NATO has gone through. You will see the really enormous change since 2010 where the previous strategic concept was adopted. So obviously that is what the next strategic con concept will attempt to do, which will be to capture the collective will of the allies based on the assessment, the common assessment of strategic environments, the threats, and decide where the adaptation of NATO as political military alliance should go to. So this is no doubt going to be a big discussion, a very important discussion, both on the political but also on military side. And it will deal with the core tasks that we have them now, which is currently the collective defense crisis management and cooperative security. Do they change? Whether they should change, if they change, how? 
there are several challenges, and the, the, what we know is that uh, the big changes that have taken place, the biggest defense and deterrence uh, adjustment has taken place since the end of the Cold War. The uh, NATO allies, more than half of the NATO allies, are present uh, in the northeast borders of the alliance to very physically ensure the, the uh, sort of collective nature of that will to defer, to deter and defend if necessary. Uh, we have two new domains that have been included in all our uh, operations, planning, thinking, exercising, which is space and, and cyber. We have new policies in place on emerging disruptive technologies, the artificial intelligence, uh, the autonomy, the quantum, the, the robotics. It's, it's all taking place as we speak. Of course, for the future, the decision making at the speed of relevance, both on the, on the political and military side, will be crucial. The readiness in, that is based on awareness. So again, investment in uh, ISR, in indications, warnings, in understanding this commonality of the threat and the ability to respond. And of course, <laughs> The whole resilience of the societies, it's not going to be governments who need to respond. It's the whole society. When we look at the private sector, we already know that most of the cyber attacks are responded to on the private sector side. They are the first that experience sometimes pretty brutal, brutal attacks. And they are tested day and every day. So the same with the, with the uh, civil society, with every one of us. So the resilience in that respect will be crucial, and that will, there is no one uh, sort of scenario that fits all, both in terms of the organization of resilience, in terms of, of uh, how we as societies uh, respond and how we as, society, as societies prepare. So in that respect, uh, indeed, the communality of values, the cooperation internationally with the partners, like-minded partners, whether it's understanding what China is doing. And of course, we know that China is a big discussion and you have seen that the last communique has pretty strong language in that respect. That is a change from the previous communique. So um, we, we will uh, discuss and we will adjust and we will plan for the future. That is no doubt. And there are several, several elements in that. Thank you, Barbara, wonderfully disciplined. I can see the, the headline in the press now, the new NATO whole of society strategic partnership. It's, uh, it's got a ring to it. Eric, five minutes, please. Well, thank you so much, Julian, and thank you for letting me be with you virtually from Washington. Um, and I think what I'll do is maybe try to give a bit of a perspective from how the strategic concept looks from Washington and how the Biden administration is thinking. I mean, look, I mean, I think, you know, as, as Baiba correctly mentioned, you know, this is a big deal. The last strategic concept from Lisbon in 2010 you know, it's really was outdated even, you know, maybe by 2014 by Crimea and kind of lacked strategic focus. And as Baiba mentioned, so much has changed since then with, with the US uh, shifting its attention to the Indo-Pacific, the rise of China, a more aggressive Russia in Europe's neighborhood, an unstable neighborhood, increased, you know, cyber hybrid threats, new technologies, and so on and so forth. So it's really about defining, I think, NATO's role in an era of strategic competition and clarifying its what priorities and capabilities it should have, and then how to bring all the allies on board with kind of a roadmap for implementation. And I think this is really what Biden wants to do. He wants to, you know, he's talking about rebuilding and reinventing alliances, but I think he sees the strategic concept as a way to get European allies themselves to understand why they need to invest in their own security and defense and resilience. Um, and that's why the, the strategic concept cannot just be, you know, lowest common denominator again. It really needs to bring both, I think, unity and cohesion, certainly, you know, post the experience we had with, with President Trump, but also, you know, more recently, post Afghanistan, post AUKUS, and amid a lot of other divisions among NATO allies. But then it also needs to, I think, provide a real strategic framework for the alliance, kind of like the national security strategy here in the United States, which then, you know, informs defense planning. I think that's really the purpose of, of the strategic concept as well, to kind of inform what the next capabilities should, goals should be after 2024 and, and as we look ahead towards the next decade. So I think from a Washington perspective, you know, they're very big expectations. Um, and I think there's a lot at stake. Um, and we're, we're, you know, I think the jury is still out, um, but, you know, it, 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 it's an opportunity. 
Um, and I'll come back. I have some other ideas in terms of what the challenges and priorities will be, but I'll happy to come back to that and, and, and hear what the other panelists have to say as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I, 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 that's a very great way to put it, a sort of NATO security strategy, because so many countries are producing national security strategies these days in which they do match assessment with capability. And it strikes me that this strategic concept, that's the test that it's essentially going to have to pass. Thomas. Thank you much, Julian, and uh, really delighted to be to be here uh, in Riga. Always uh, happy to come. I have a lot of friends here, and if, even if it's uh, the price of an early flight, which I really hate, but it's um, again uh, uh, and kind of comfortable to speak uh, after such um, uh, eloquent um, uh, predecessors, and uh, this allows me to pick on some uh, of the themes. I think that the future of the strategic concept indeed could be uh, encapsulated through, through uh, the uh, future setting of core tasks of the alliance indeed. And from the Polish perspective, this is very much about restoring the centrality of the collective defense as the core mission of the alliance. And uh, from that perspective, we should uh, not treat the, the current formulation of three core tasks as so, some sort of a dogma. After all, they've been um, adopted uh, in 2010 in a very peculiar geopolitical situation. And I would even argue that perhaps it wasn't uh, ever uh, up to date even at that moment since in 2010 we were already after certain aggressive uh, actions uh, that were conducted by, by uh, Russia. And yet this was the least defense heavy strategic concept out of any that Alliance had adopted. So it's about the continuity. It's about and from that continuity to perspective of 70 years of the alliance, actually, the, one could say that 1999 and 2010 were some sort, some sort of a, a disruption rather than um, trend uh, setters. I know this is a bit controversial, but still, I, I would like to uh, sort of uh, show that into a, a debate. Then the future of the crisis management. And uh, again, I mean, uh, from Polish perspective, we would like the alliance to we like the alliance to be the pre prime military security and defense co organization for the political west so that means that we don't want to do away with other sort of security related tasks but again it should be uh, the collective defense in the first place because this is the most ambitious out of the, out of the core task and then of course we should find a way uh, and a will to do uh, to address other security challenges that are connected to, for instance, the crisis management. But again, here the Afghanistan and the lessons learned will bring us some answers. And uh, I think that we should be more realistic and pragmatic in addressing, in ad addressing those kinds of uh, challenges, uh, sort of stabilization challenges. Uh, um, lastly, partnerships. Uh, I think we are in a, in, a, in a completely different environment. Just recall the, the wording on, uh, on, on Russia from the, from the last strategy concept. We need to take stock uh, of that. That doesn't mean that we should be closing doors to Russia, but again, I mean, we are in, in, a, in a different environment. Also resilience, I mean, because yeah. perhaps, I mean, this should, I mean, one could have a debate whether, whether we should le have less core task or, or more. And, and resilience is, is a very important tool. Uh, connected to collective defense, but possibly also connected to other challenges coming from other ge geopolitical directions, like, for instance, China. And this is going to be, be, be another big debate in the context of this tragic uh, concept. Thank you, Thomas. I'm, I'm going to open the floor now, but I just want to, 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 to put a question into the air. All of this has got to happen in the context of the post-COVID economy. Um, and what I'm hearing is capabilities, capabilities, capabilities. It has to be paid for. So. Think about that, and how are we going to, to achieve those ends given the economic reality? I'm going to invite first uh, an old uh, friend of mine, uh, Ian Brzezinski, to, to, to ask a question. Are you going to ask a question, sir, as well? Followed by that gentleman behind. Ian, please, come to this microphone here. Yep. Thank you, Julian. It's good to see some old friends. And uh, I guess since I just got off the, the plane, I'm a little bit cranky. So let me ask so this much. question. You know, what is, why was NATO created? Uh, what's its primary mission? And its primary mission is to throw lead downrange. That's why it won the Cold War. That's why it was effective deterring war. That's why it's been operationally effective in Afghanistan. And that's what we want it to do. 
when I think about strategy documents from the United States, we have our national security strategy that Eric talked about. We also have our NDS, our national defense strategy. It strikes me that we really want the NATO strategic concept to really be akin to a national defense strategy by a national security strategy. Because when I look at the evolution of strategic concepts, they become increasingly more and more like a smorgasbord of a variety of issues that kind of dilute the focus and attention on the core mission, throwing lead down range, developing war fighting cap capacities for whatever, high intensity warfare, counterterrorism, what, what, be it, what be it. So I wanted to ask you all, will this strategic concept be different? Will it, should it be different and return back to that core focus on actual military war fighting skills and capabilities that need to be brought to bear and kind of stay away from things that really don't fall into NATO's domain? Thank you, Ian. You're always cranky, mate, so don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> let me go in reverse order here. Tomasz. Thank you, uh, Julian, and um, very good question by, uh, by Ian, but uh, let me address also your first, uh, some of your first remarks. You've, you've mentioned uh, cohesion, and I think you've mentioned a, a technological change to the battlefield. And let me be a little bit contrarian. Uh, here, I think this is uh, because I think you wanted to get across the change and sort of the, the, yeah. the, the cohesion will not su suffice. I think that in terms of the capabilities, um, I think uh, we can achieve a lot by cohesion and consistency. I think we've got a lot of capabilities here in Europe and it's about actually harnessing them better for the goals of the Alliance. What has cr over 20 years of crisis management operation done to us it's actually that uh, we've detached great majority of our forces from NATO planning, force structure, and exercises, and we need to re re sort of restore that connection. So this is about uh, cohesion in, 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 some, in some way. Can so I jump in there, Tomasz? Does that mean the strategic concept should be more like flexible response in 1967 than, say, 2010 Lisbon? And, that... uh, and uh, very much, I, I, I think it also brings us, uh, this to, to, to Ian's question. Indeed. There's been an evolu evolution of, of strategic concepts that have become more and more politically, uh, politically sort of, sort of uh, de develop uh, the documents. Uh, and I'm, I think this one should, and I think it will be more um, of a military nature, not exclusively military nature. Yeah. Of course, we need to um, uh, understand the p political environment. We, we need to bring uh, all our allies on board. But what is different right now? I mean, we've recognized the threat. And for a um, couple of years now, uh, the Alliance uh, has, again, military strategy and other do documents that stem from that, other concepts that, that stem from that. So, I mean, it's actually difficult to imagine, but for almost 20 years, the Alliance uh, operated without the military strategy. It was a kind of an ad hoc military organization rather than a cohesive one. So we are in a different situation and a new strategic concept should take stock of that and should, should recognize it. Thank you. Eric, Sure. You respond to that question? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Ian. And of course, I mean, I, I think we should be wary of mission creep and thinking that NATO can do everything. I do think, you know, as been mentioned, the core task for, you know, for NATO needs to be deterrence and, and collective defense of, of Europe on the eastern flank. That's very clear. Uh, but I do think NATO can play a role um, when it comes to projecting regional stability in its neighborhood. It may not always be NATO as an alliance, as an organization. It may be flexible coalitions operating with US or, or NATO support, but I think there's certainly a role for NATO there. And as also been mentioned, I think there is a role for NATO on on resilience, um, you know, working alongside the European Union, for instance, on resilience issues within Europe, but also on projecting those in the neighborhood in ways that actually serves, I think, the, 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 that works alongside the, the uh, deterrence and kind of more, more military aspects of what NATO is doing on the eastern flank to, to essentially deter uh, Russia. So I think that's actually is very complementary. Where I do think we should, you know, the strategic concept needs to be very clear is about NATO's role in the Indo-Pacific. And I think we've, we've had this debate now post AUKUS. I'm very concerned that NATO should play, you know, the notion that NATO should play a military role in the Indo-Pacific. I think that is stretching our resources way too thin. Um, that said, you know, I do think that NATO can play a role in terms of partnerships with Indo-Pacific partners. And maybe especially on some of those resilience issues um, where, where NATO can be a platform for 
for engaging on things like, you know, 5G, 6G standards, uh, the whole issue about tech and, and supply chain uh, decoupling issues related to China, sharing information, sharing intelligence, uh, participating in training, those kind of things. But that's, I think, is very different from playing a military role in the Indo-Pacific. And we should be wary, I think, of, of doing that. Because I think, you know, to your point, Ian, I think, you know, if defense planners are looking to the NATO strategic concept for guidance, I think it would send very confusing signals if, if a priority is, you know, NATO playing a role in the Indo-Pacific in terms of then informing European countries what capabilities they should be, they should be, you know, developing. And that's why having the, the priorities, I think, very clear uh, is so important. And, and that's what the strategic concept needs to deliver on. Thank you, Eric. Uh, don't worry, we Brits are, it's called AUKUS. Um, bye bye. Um, Jan, welcome, welcome to Riga. Uh, good to see you here. The, um, the question is very pertinent, obviously. You know, what type of document are we going to have? And, and there were classified strategic concepts. There have been now open public documents. So it will be an expression of 30 allied collective, collective will. It will be created by all 30 together. So it's, it's, I'm not uh, currently saying what type of document, but it has to be very clear enough and strategic enough for the military to take guidance and to be able to inter interpret that for their planning and everything. And as Thomas said, of course, we have the whole set of documents in, in force that, uh, as we speak, also you know, are, are forming the basis of action, what we do. Quite clearly, when we compare to when the alliance was established, and it's, it's very interesting to reread uh, the 1947, 48, and 49 uh, papers of the time. You have to remember that it was not uh, an alliance as we see it now. It was very much against Germany, actually. The, it was Germany who, that was the sort of external challenger at the time, still, uh, when uh, you read the protocols. So uh, in that respect, of course, the alliance has adopted and we will adopt. It's just the reality of what is happening uh, as we speak. The response measures, the awareness, so the data-enabled threats that we face don't recognize borders, that is for sure, Where, wherever they come from, that is one thing. There are uh, hard security threats, as we know. Also, we just saw how part of the territory of a country was taken away and, and uh, using all possible measures, hard, soft, hybrid, and, and, and uh, uh, whatever you can imagine. And uh, we will need to formulate those responses at 30 for our military, for our politicians, and for societies, because the response has to be and the ability to act at all levels. There is no just one response to that today, because there are threats that don't recognize the borders anymore. Thank you, Baiba. Um, I'm going to abuse my role as chairman by taking questions and then assigning them to one of my panels so we can get through as many questions as possible. Sir, please identify yourself and uh, your question, please. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Frederick Leikvist. I'm director of something called Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies. And I used to serve as Sweden's first ambassador for countering hybrid threats. So my question will go in the opposite direction of, of Ian's. Uh, will there and should be there a, a special place for, for hybrid threats uh, in, in, in the strategic concept? And I will explain the question a little bit because cyber is often mentioned and cyber is often mentioned as a, its own domain. Not but too with, long, please. Short, uh, yeah. short point. Yep. But, but hybrid threats are composite and, 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 and multifaceted. So will there be, and it's not only about resilience, it's also about situational awareness, connecting the dots and deterrence for sub-threshold uh, sub uh, threats. Uh, 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 non-military character. Will there be a place for that? And what's the division of labor between EU and NATO and the coordination, if there should be any, between the strategic concept and the strategic compass? Great question. Thank you very much. Thomas, you want to take that? Uh... I can try. Uh, well, uh, for, uh, when, I speak about the, uh, when I speak about the hybrid threats, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is, is that, there, again, is that there's more continuity than, than change. I mean, actually, coming from Poland again, I, in, in 1920s, we used to have green... Uh, men on, on our eastern borders. I and mean, actually, we, we know Russian predilection towards information warfare already from, uh, I think, 17th uh, century. So, the, the, but just, I mean, technological reality may change, but certain concepts and approaches do not change that much. So this is, this is one. So this is also restoring uh, the alliance ability to operate throughout the continuum of peace, crisis, and war on a political and on a military level. This is, and, and, and I think new, 
on a military level, we, we are actually getting that right. I think it's important to be able to get that right also on a, on a political uh, level. The second uh, thing is the is is uh, resilience. Indeed, we ne we need to find way how to provide certain uh, benchmarks uh, and how to uh, how to sort of hold the allies ac ac accountable for uh, for for them. And indeed, it links us also to the NATO EU question. Uh, I can agree with that EU has very unique instrumentarium. Uh, and there needs to be a healthy dialogue. Poland is very much in favor of that. But I don't think this is really about functional or, or sort of a, a division debate, or this is kind of on a, on a technocratic side. It's more about certain political uh, stumbling uh, blocks uh, between so, some of the allies and, and some of the member states. And they need to be solved uh, in order for us to proceed more smoothly and, and uh, cooperate more smoothly. Thank you. I mean, I'm getting the sense that this thing is going to be as long as the Encyclopedia Britannica. There's going to be a lot of issues inside the strategic concept. So I, I pity the poor drafters. Any brief comments from my other two colleagues before we move on? Um, Baiba? Just to say is that hybrid indeed had a place both in, in, in the communiques in the last few years. So it's very difficult to imagine that suddenly the Allies would drop yeah will drop the whole concept of hybrid. And when we think about it, yes, we can see that there are hybrid attacks without the hard sort of element in them also in the future, but it would be difficult to imagine a hard sort of action, a kinetic action without having a hybrid yeah, element indeed, in all of them. Already it's, there. So it's Absolutely. just, we, Absolutely. we can't really separate that. In fact, from the early other. in the Brussels communique, it says that that previous language will be inserted in the strategic concept. Quickly, Eric, a, a point? Yeah. No, I just, just to weigh in, I mean, I, th I think this is an important point because I think in the, you know, this era of great power competition that we find ourselves in, especially facing authoritarian countries like Russia and China, you know, yes, there, there's a clear, at least when it comes to NATO from Russia, a clear military threat, but, you know, we're constantly being, being under, you know, attack from various types of non-military um, ways. And I think that's really important that NATO, you know, plays a role there. I mean, you know, the, 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 the challenges that China constitutes towards NATO um, it's not military and probably won't be for a long time, but, but it is a serious threat. Um, it has to do with information security. It has to do with control of infrastructure, critical infrastructure, ports. Um, it has to do with, you know, influence operations and disinformation, economic coercion. Um, maybe not all of these are areas that NATO traditionally deals with, but I do think NATO needs to play a role in addressing these issues alongside the EU, alongside other, other players, other member states, um, because that's, that's inevitable. You can't just, you can't just uh, distinguish between military and non-military and just say that NATO is going to do the military. It needs, to do, it needs to look at this comprehensively, and hybrid is a big piece of that. Thank you. Uh, before we say too categorically about the Chinese, I've just written a big report for the European Parliament on the EU and Arctic security, and there are certain developments going on Greenland research laboratories where there are some very strange looking Chinese scientists appearing in uh, parts of Greenland. So I think this could come quicker than we think. Uh, first, Ben Hodges, and then I have a question from my hope is a young person, anonymous from social media. Ben, please. So uh, the nature of war is constant, but the character of war obviously is changing. And, and this has been talked about uh, throughout the day, uh, which means that the requirement for SACUR to be able to identify the threats soon enough so that we can act soon enough to prevent the crisis from ever happening. Will the strategic concept give SACUR the authority to do things uh, within this uh, a new construct to prevent the crisis from ever happening? So in other words, delegating more authority to SACUR uh, so that he can act, so that he can start moving things to prevent a crisis. And in that same vein, how do we as an alliance based on collective security of its members, how do you get the initiative instead of always reacting to what the Kremlin does? How can we get the initiative uh, without being seen as overly provocative by some, uh, some members of the alliance? Thank you, Ben. Uh, ben and I have just published with John Allen a new book for Oxford called uh, Future War and Defense of Europe which is brilliant and very reasonably priced on Amazon. Um, who wants to take that? That's a fairly, I mean, that issue of delegated authority, you know, one of the issues in the book is hyperwar. And hyperwar is an accelerated warfare where you, you can't go into the kind of formal procedures. 
you've got to have a, a very, very rapid response mechanism. And that strikes me as a crucial challenge for the Alliance. Who wants to take Bible? You want to take that one on first? Um, I, will, I, will, I will say a few words because yeah, obviously, uh, obviously we all understand that is, again, in, yeah. the, in the data Personal enabled yeah. environment, that is the obvious question that comes to all of us. You know, what is the decision making at this age? What is the uh, sort of preemptive measures? What are the levels of, of delegations that, that are there? And not necessarily that has to be addressed in the strategic concept per se. It's a strategic level document. So there will be uh, the formulations that will allow the military to, to take uh, it further. But quite clearly, you know, speaking about the adaptation, it's not only the political adaptation, it's not only decision making, it's not only the joint intelligence sharing that we now have at NATO that has been, you know, escalated uh, after, after Ukraine to an unseen level. And, and this joint awareness and joint understanding of threats that we've been able to reach on everyday basis. Huh? But it's also really about the actual actions that then need to be taken. And, and again, it's not going to be formulated in so many words in the strategic concept, Ben, as you know, but uh, there will be, the Allies will reach a consensus on, on what we need. Indeed. For the I mean, it, so I have no doubt, you know, when you look at NATO's future, this is what we do. This I mean, it's the already Alliance. there in the de de deterrence concept and the warfighting concept. There are two other classified documents, as I understand it, that begin to address these issues, which I won't refer to. So this is going on already. There's a certain, uh, NATO is aware of this challenge. Eric. I, I think the only thing I'll, I'll just add is, I mean, I think the, 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 the question also raised the point of sort of reacting early and early warning um, and, and NATO's institutional and decision-making setup. And I think one thing there that can be approved, uh, improved that I hope the strategic concept can at least contribute to is making NATO also more of a platform for political dialogue, not just military dialogue, because I think that, you know, in order to act early, in order to be aware of emerging uh, challenges coming at NATO, we need to talk about that. And I think if there's anything that AUKUS and Afghanistan and these crises that have, or I guess Afghanistan was a crisis, AUKUS was a diplomatic crisis perhaps. But anyway, what they, what they point to, I think, is sort of the lack of political dialogue in NATO as such. And I think that's something that needs to be strengthened and can maybe then help with sort of spotting the, the, the threats coming and, and taking more early initiative, which NATO clearly needs to do. Um, and that's why that piece needs to be strengthened and the strategic concept should at least contribute to, to making that happen. Thank you, I, and I agree with you, Eric, but I don't think the strategic concept should say everything. Uh, comprehensive political guidance, there's a whole host of other sub-documents that will come out of it. I mean, it, it begs a fundamental question, who is the audience of a strategic concept? What is it for? And I think the Alliance has to be very clear, the NAP has to be clear about what it's for and who is the audience as, as we move forward. Baiba, you want to come back briefly, then I'll just, move to Tom. Just a quick two-finger. I think we clearly have to understand that the nature of deterrence is, is changing. It yeah. includes, yes, nuclear. It includes, you know, conventional. It includes integrated air missile defense in that respect, where we, you know, there is a whole new development there. Yeah. It, invo it involves the whole society approach. It involves the ability of the whole society to withstand and resist crisis resist Absolutely. anything. So in that respect, you know, there is, there is a, a big change happening in all our societies, yes. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, this whole hybrid warfare, cyber warfare, hyper warfare continuum, that is the continuum of deterrence as well. Tomas. Well, on, on pre-delegated uh, authorities? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm absolutely on this side of the, of the debate. Uh, our, the current strategic environment requires us to act, to act in a more agile way. We need to have prepared plans on the shelf, sort of a, a crisis reaction measures that are, that are, that they are prepared. Uh, of course, NAC needs to retain some political control, but it doesn't mean that we, we have to follow the current model, which is very much sort of crisis management geared with a long, cumbersome process and very much ad hoc based yeah. I mean, we, as a result of that lack of military strategy for many years. So we need to adapt for that. Indeed, there'll be pressure to retain political control, but it doesn't, I mean, it, it, it just cannot uh, be the stumbling uh, block for uh, execution of, uh, of our reaction. Otherwise, we will. Uh, a lot of will, 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 will just happen on, on national basis. And if allies want to, want to sort of cohere over, over our reaction to, uh, to the threat, we need to give more flexibility to the secure. And then sort of debate it, work it through within the NAC. 
I mean, uh, sort of prior prior to the to the reaction to plans, to to concepts and doctrines. I mean, it strikes me that the, the, the agility of future decision making will be a key component in credible deterrence. If we haven't got it, deterrence itself is undermined as a, as a communication to an adversary. But you're absolutely right. So bear with me for a second. I have a question on uh, on the social media that I want to do, I want to get going. The question is, the Biden-Macron joint statement finds the US as complementary to the EU. How does the panel see the new strategic concept addressing the EU-NATO relationship? Well, I'm going to go to, to Eric for that first. How does the Biden administration see it? it? It's a great question. And I think this is something that the strategic concept needs to deliver on. It's actually clarifying this kind of age-old question about what is the European pillar in NATO? What does it actually mean? Um, and what I think the concept has an opportunity to do, given I think the, the more positive view that the Biden administration has about the European Union and NATO, which we saw both in the Biden-Macron phone call and we saw that in the EU-US joint statement from June, is to move away, I think, from what has been, unfortunately, quite a divisive debate in recent years on this whole notion of strategic autonomy. And maybe focusing less on these abstract concepts and have the strategic concept come out and actually endorse EU defense initiatives and acknowledge that they play an important role um, and, and an important complementary and compatible role to NATO. Uh, so I think that's actually really important. And then spelling out the expectations on, on European NATO allies and ways that the European Union as an entity can also contribute both to deterrence in the East in these areas that we've talked about, including hybrid, but also in crisis management in, in the neighborhood. So I think Here's a, a real opportunity, but also you know, a real challenge. And, and, and you know, given that there's also going to be the EU strategic compass coming out in the next few months. So making sure that these two documents are aligned, are complementary, um, is going to be is going to be hugely important. But I think there's an opportunity here to, to you know, move beyond this divisive debate and, and, and really move towards you know, uh, building or clarifying what a European pillar in NATO actually means. That's a good point, Eric, but I, I go back. If, if we are to make a NATO-EU relationship strategic, it's got to be built on capabilities. I mean, I fully understand there are certain complex contingencies in you which you wouldn't want a NATO flag on it or a national flag on it. An EU flag would communicate a different identity. And I wonder, and I'll put this to my, my, my two colleagues here on the stage, whether we can finally get some kind of Berlin Plus type arrangements properly working. Thomas, you want to take that first? Well, I, I think, you know, functionally, again, there's not really a problem to find a, very, a good solution for, a good formula for NATO-EU to, to, to cooperate, to, to, to divide labor. The problem is really uh, among, uh, I mean, the problem lies within uh, certain differences between some of the allies and some of the member states yeah. of, the, of the EU. And yeah. once that is solved, and I think, think we should really pay, the, I mean, sort of direct our efforts towards that rather than for finding new formulas that, that would allow us to go uh, around that. Because, and not really f uh, fall for the trap of the debate on strategic autonomy or European army. I think that what's below those words, I mean, actually what different actors have in mind is actually much closer when we actually talk to the French, to the, to, to Germans, to the US, it's really, uh, indeed, much more about capabilities than about creating sort of a parallel decision making uh, and command uh, structure. I would also be worried about giving too much uh, uh, sort of uh, work uh, on that to bureaucracies. I mean, bureaucracies tend to be yeah. sort of, you know, <laughs> steer themselves towards the institutional interest. Once we uh, have a healthy debate among member states and allies, I think we can end up in a, in a, in a rather healthy uh, spot. Thank you. Baiba? Um, I think that we quite clearly have recognized the US strategic partner for NATO. Yeah. That, that strategic yeah. partnership is recognized by everyone. That is uh, what we do on the basis of that. The cooperation that we have is just excellent. The unprecedented levels of exchange of information uh, Daily, weekly meetings, exchanges, there's, you know, there's a very rich, <laughs> very yeah. practical cooperation. So I would disagree with those that try to spin some type of, you know, disagreements and, you know, buff up uh, certain, you know, total differences among the organizations. Uh, they are not really there. They are, of course, the nuances and how allies or how certain countries perceive each other, that is a different thing. But again, as among, you know, organizations to, to ensure that there is a very practical collaboration to, to resist the external threats that we recognize on both sides that uh, there exist. 
Um, it, it just, we are going ahead with that. It's just, it's just working. So um, also in my field in strategic communications, it's just everyday collaboration. Yeah, but it does, uh, I'll come back to you in a second, I'm sure. But it is a strategic partnership is a two-way thing. And given the importance of NATO planning functions, harmonization of planning will be vital. But also, given that 80% of, of capabilities are now outside the EU, then surely the EU's third country arrangements need to change as well. Because the idea that major powers like the uh, UK or Turkey or, or anybody else in the US and Canada have signed up to military mobility, do not have a say over an EU operation, effectively denies the EU that access. So I think there's a whole range of questions that are indeed still outstanding. Yeah, just, just one uh, additional sentence. I, I, I would like to say that indeed there is some risk in this concept of, kind of US EU security or defense cooperation. Yeah. To us, indeed, this is NATO, which should be the platform to engage uh, EU Atlantic uh, allies over security and, and, and defense. And of course, there is a complementary role for the EU in that. But just that. Thank you. Sir, and who are you and what did your question? But, but oh, sorry, sorry. Just one more. You're, you're totally right, of course, investment in capabilities, and that was the same what the Prime Minister said. It's really the capabilities yeah. that matter at the end, so we need to have those, and it's secondary. You know. It's a sine qua non of all of this. Yeah, if, I, if I may come in quickly on that point, if I may, yeah. on, on EU-US defense cooperation, it's a topic that I follow, and I think it's actually, you know, I don't see it as necessarily a bad thing for NATO. I actually think there are good reasons for, given that the EU is becoming a stronger security defense actor on its own, new initiatives like PESCO, European Defense Fund, so on and so forth. Um, I think it's a good idea to have the EU as an institution talk more to Washington, including the Defense Department, which they traditionally haven't. And I think it's been positive to see the Biden administration joining PESCO, participating, you know, and I think there's more that, you know, could be, could be discussed in this context of U.S., and the EU, that doesn't really, you know, I think it's very complementary yeah. to, to, to NATO's role. So I don't see that as problematic. It's a vital issue. Absolutely right. Sir, who are you and what is your question? Uh, this is Shota Gwinaria from Baltic Defense College. And uh, Mr. Lindley French, I hope you remember two years ago we shared a panel organized by... We NGO. did. Indeed. And it's the face mask. Title, and the title of that uh, panel was... Uh, contested territories between Russia and NATO, and we both heavily criticize that topic. So there are two components to what NATO has to be doing. One is defending its own territory, and the second is projecting security and stability outside the allied territory, right? So in this context, there has been 13 years since the Bucharest summit decision where Georgia and Ukraine were promised to become part of NATO, and there has been literally zero progress on this political integration path. Of course, there is a lot of cooperation, but on the integration path, there is no progress whatsoever. So does 2022 document somehow have a clear vision on the future of this in-between territories uh, from NATO? And uh, uh, actually, it is obvious that Russia will continue treating this in-between territories as, as its sphere of exclusive influence. We have suffered two wars since the Bucharest summit decision, so there has to be a unified vision by NATO and all the allies on the future of that uh, area. So if Thank you have you. any comments on that. Great question, and great to see you again. And I, I suppose that boils down to, is the open door still open? Who wants to lead off on? Bye, but you want to lead off on, on that? Um, that is very obvious. The open door policy is in force and it's not going to change and it was reaffirmed in the communique just a few months ago in the, in the summit. And uh, the last thing I would like to Georgia identify itself on is the contested territory. Georgia is a sovereign country, a European sovereign country with strong democratic institutions that need to be still strengthened and is doing great reforms, proud people, excellent excellent country with rich culture and bright future. So, you know, the last thing that, that needs is to, to actually diminish uh, that in respect. As for, the, as for the joining of NATO and whether, you know, there is a consensus among the allies for admitting, admitting the next group of aspirants, that is, that is a different question. It requires both the aspirant to be ready and for NATO to be ready, and the open door policy is and will remain in force. Well, uh, Poland uh, stays 
uh, clearly behind 2008 because summit decision that Ukraine and Georgia will become uh, NATO uh, allies. Uh, of course, we have to uh, work on the sort of pragmatic conditions on that. We also work on, uh, have to work on cohesion among uh, allies. However, indeed, we cannot grant Russia NATO. In the meantime, we have to look for uh, bringing these countries closer. And I wouldn't agree that there's, I mean, nothing has been happening. For instance, Ukraine has been granted the EUP status in the in between. And this is something, this is the opportunity that uh, still can be harnessed, harnessed to its full um, potential. Eric. I completely agree uh, with, with what was said. I mean, I think besides keeping the open door open, um, I think NATO should continue to project security and stability to these countries that we're talking about, providing more, whether it's cybersecurity assistance or working more on the issues that we discussed earlier on hybrid or disinformation, um, you know, working alongside the EU doing all of these things to, to assist these countries become more resilient uh, against the, the pressures that we're gonna see from Russia and, and others. So I think that's really NATO's role as kind of a resilience hub and projector of stability in its region while continuing to keep the door open, of course. I have a question from social media, which I, I'm not sure, I, I'm gonna read it out, but I don't think anyone will take it. Is, does the EU-US Trade and Tech Council consolidate, consolidate the status of the EU as a partner, I take it of NATO, instead of instant individual states, especially in emergent challenges? Does anyone want to take that? Eric? Not sure I fully understand the question. I think no, the, I the I Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council is potentially important. We just had the first uh, leaders meeting in September. There was some progress, I think, especially on the kind of defensive technology issues like export control, FDI screening, uh, but there's a need to do more. Um, I think this is a positive thing because if you read a statement from the TTC, without saying so, it essentially deals with the technological challenges we're facing from China. And I think it's important to have this, um, you know, link between the U.S. and the EU. And I think for NATO, that's good news. And I think it recognizes that, you know, um, on a lot of these, these regulatory issues, you know, it's not really NATO uh, that's the key actor in Europe. It's the EU. So having the U.S. and the EU deal more with some of these issues on, on technology and digital issues, including dealing with disinformation and regulating social media platforms, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's good for NATO. And I don't think that detracts from, from NATO's role as the kind of bedrock of, of transatlantic security. On the contrary. Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to go further with that question unless there's someone. Fabio, you want to jump in there? Just to say at a personal level that uh, uh, indeed the partnership that is based on values is, is very valuable. And what we see there, it deals with supply chains, yep. it deals with data tech governance, it deals with AI, it deals with a whole set of issues that we are also dealing with in NATO. So as larger the community on, on, on the basis of what we can work together in terms of, you know, uh, achieving the same uh, if not the same, but similar outcomes in terms of what we want for our security, defense, and our societies, and, and having those partnerships, uh, be it EU, US, or be it with the uh, AP4 partners or, or Georgia, Ukraine, it's, you know, it's, it's good for all of us. I mean, I would add to that that what that question hints at is a much bigger question, which is if we are to invest in the technology of future war, which is artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analytics, uh, drone swarms, uh, nanotechnologies. I find it hard to see how that could happen without many current export controls on both sides of the Atlantic being removed. Because there's going to have to be a much more fluid transatlantic tech exchange mm -hmm. to underpin that growth. Because I can't see the European defense and technological industrial base producing this stuff. And I think the US is going to have to be willing to share black box technologies with allies that in the past it's been uncomfortable about. If, if they want the alliance to be a useful ally, and that's going to be a question for the US. Now, we have 10 minutes left. I want to finish off in reverse order. Sorry, uh, Alan, a bit late, mate. Um, by asking you a direct question, all of you. <laughs> what will NATO look like in 2030? Just how different will NATO be in 2030 compared with 2021? I'll start off with Eric. Ooh, that's, that's an easy question. It's still only morning here and I've only had one cup of coffee. But um, look, I mean, I think to me, 
there, there are a lot of things that will probably be different. But to me, one of the things that really needs to be different and where the strategic concept can help us get there is to really make sort of NATO more European, to have this, you know, we talked about a European pillar in NATO. I think we really need that. I mean, the US, I'm sitting in Washington. The debate here is all about China and the Indo-Pacific. I think the strategic shift to the Indo-Pacific will inform strategic attention, will inform resources that the US allocates um, away from the Middle East, as we've seen with Afghanistan and elsewhere, and away from Europe. I don't think that means, and I think we, it would be a mistake to draw the conclusion that it means that the US will disengage from Europe or you know, abandon European security. I don't think so. On the contrary, in an age of strategic competition, I think you know having Europe remain a stable democratic ally is very important for the United States. But it does mean that I think Europe will have to take more responsibility. And I think there's greater US expectations that Europeans will do so, not only on managing instability in, 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 in you know, the European South, but also frankly, on contributing to deterrence on the Eastern flank. So a NATO that is, has, has a greater European leadership role, and that puts you know, the onus on the big three, UK, France, Germany. I think it also puts a, a burden on smaller member states to also contribute and, 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 and you know, shaping this, this European uh, pillar within NATO with US support and with US encouragement. And that's how I think we reconcile this age-old debate uh, and put it to rest. It's a stronger, more capable, more resilient Europe anchored in the transatlantic alliance. And I think that's frankly something that you know, everyone around the table should be able to agree on at this point. Thank you, Eric. Strategic autonomy is a function of power, not words. I couldn't agree more. Thomas. Well, uh, let me tackle uh, sort of more of the defense side of it. I, I think we, we'll need to restore the capacity for the alliance to be able to tackle large scale, scale threats coming from uh, state actors. This is, this is one. At the same time, retaining some of the uh, capabilities and functions and processes that, that we've gained over uh, 20, 30 years of uh, operations out of area, uh, tackling some of the new te technological uh, trends, and also through the resilience lens, perhaps being a useful tool to ta tackle threats coming out of the area of responsibility of the uh, strategic uh, commander. This is also a question of economy of effort. And I see two aspects here. One is some regional fo focus will be needed in the alliance in terms of the capabilities. We have to uh, do away with the notion that everything will be, I mean, everything will have to be able to do the same in, in, in the alliance. At the same time, we have to assure that everyone has some skin in the, in the game. This, that also pertains to the to possible engagement in uh, Asia Pacific I mean, having in mind that, 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 that I mean, that there are some clearly defined boundaries of the alliance. Uh, still, I think uh, I, I think Europeans can do m more in the European uh, theatre rather than going sort of beyond beyond it. But we need to maintain cohesion and relevance also for the US uh, uh, of of NATO as the Euro-Atlantic uh, platform. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Bye bye. It will continue to be a strong alliance, political military alliance of 30 or more allies that is able both to deter against a whole range of threats from nuclear to hybrid and also to defend if necessary. And it will have adapted to the new age uh, that we all have entered. It's simple as that. Thank you. Um... Let me conclude this excellent panel. I'm grateful to my three distinguished colleagues for giving us the very open views on, on, on the strategic concept of NATO's future. You know, NATO at the end of the day, as a citizen who pays for it, for me, is a warfighting defensive alliance that must be able to deal with the worst case that can happen. And what is the worst case that can happen? In, in the book that Ben, John Allen, and I wrote, we open up with a scenario. And that is that the United States is faced with simultaneous crises in the Indo-Pacific, in the Middle East, possibly in the Arctic, and in Europe. And is stretched thin the world over. And in that situation, it is up to Europeans to be the credible high-end first responders to take the pressure off the United States, to keep America strong where America needs to be strong, in return for the maintenance of the security guarantee to Europeans. That is, to our mind, to my mind, the future of burden sharing. 
And that the strategic concept must deal with this issue of burden sharing, but it must also deal with the issue of what the future war battle space will look like, the technology that's emerging and disruptive technologies that are entering the NATO, the NATO uh, uh, era and NATO arena. Now, at the core of that, I can see no real way around something that looks like what we call an Allied Command Europe heavy mobile force that is able to operate across air, sea, land, cyber, space, information and knowledge by 2030 that could be used in various ways to support EU operations, but must be much more ambitious than a NATO response force. Readiness will be vital to this. It's not just about the forward presence, it's what's behind the forward presence to maintain deterrence. But at the same time, if we're facing simultaneous engineered crises, then we've got to have sufficient mass, not just fires, to deal with crises on our southern border. Too often when I hear the discourse about deterrence in the east and increasingly in the north, North Cape, Arctic, and in the south, it's almost as though the alliance can't agree where its center of gravity is. Now, all of this, if it's going to be paid for by Europeans, will be have to paid for in the post-COVID economy. We're not going to go down the route of European defense integration. Forget all the, 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 the talk of that. We're still a long way from having the kind of governance with, which would enable that. But my final thought, and any quick response, welcome. Do we re Europeans realize the implications of change that you've been talking about for them? Or is there a certain degree of denial amongst the European body politic about what will be required from we Europeans to make this work? Very quick final thoughts. Ivan. Well, actually, Tom should speak for Europeans. I'll speak for NATO. All right. <laughs> Tom? Well, uh, yeah, well, I, I, I very much agree uh, with what you have said, maybe with some uh, nuances. One is, I mean, I, I sense a certain premium on the kind of power projection mode of uh, op operating of NATO's military. No, it's, I mean, it's focused on it, Europe. I mean, this is what, it's, uh, this is what deterrence will take. Yeah. Defense will take. Yeah, but I'm, I, I also mentioned in my, in my previous intervention this regional focus, and it brings me down to the, the some level of specialization that will be needed among among Europeans. Uh, and uh, when I speak about the uh, about restoring uh, collective defense uh, as, the, as the primary mission uh, and actually reforming NATO foreign structure and so on and so on, usually some of the colleagues from uh, from uh, Western uh, allies, they among Western allies, they, they think that we Eastern Europeans are going to ex expect more sort of uh, for our presence uh, being sent to. Actually, not. I mean, this is also about us doing more and. We have been doing more, and we will, we will do uh, more in the future. I was just uh, this afternoon uh, at, at the Latvian MOD. I spoke with my good colleague Yanis Garrisons about what they do here in Latvia about the uh, about collective defense, about total defense concept. This is absolutely, uh, the, the, I mean, uh, key to the to the alliance yeah. future and to the economy of uh, of effort. So, yeah, just just that remark to, the, that I would add to. Very quick word. We've got a minute and a half left. Bye bye. What I want to say is that, um, indeed, I think when, when we try to imagine, again, what you said, the future, the future battlefields, the, the challenges that we have, it's actually important to have that creativity and exercise and try to really practice all parts of, of our imagination, but also our, our work and action, uh, both on the political military side, you know, the s civilians and, and the whole society approach in that. And uh, when we think of that, indeed, uh, the economy plays a big role, but from other hand, we also know that our economies have been quite resilient. Eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even in the post-COVID yeah. era, when we look at it, you know, our economies are not doing badly, right? Yeah. Yes, there are rising uh, energy prices for one reason or the other. Yes, there are external challenges. It's not like they have never been there. Eh? It's not so new to, to be Europeans or Americans or, or, or others in the world. But I also would like to underline the, the global partnerships that will become ever more important. So the division between Europeans and Americans or, or Australians or others will become less important because yeah. it will be all of us actually sharing and trying to understand and then uh, to also have that action ready 
to, to, to react to what is happening. I think this is really where the values, the sort of uh, more or less democratic partnerships come into play. And, and there will be, you know, sort of soft alliances all around the world. It's just, it's just the realities that is there. Thank and you. it's great for NATO, it's great for the EU, it's great for, for all of us. Eric, would you forgive me? I have to close this session because I have an important guest that I have to introduce. <laughs> uh, it's now zero seconds, so I'm formally closing this session. <laughs> I'd like to thank my three distinguished panelists. Would you join me in saying thank you? Thank you very much. I guess this is, this thank you. Thank you. Thank you.